Welcome to the Educate the Essentials podcast. Educate the Essentials is an educational podcast that provides essential information and tips about education, leadership, and topics related to diverse learners. When we look at diverse learners, we like to include students with disabilities or exceptionality served under Section 504 and IDEA, students who need interventions such as the multi-tier system of supports, and English speakers of other languages. I'm your host, Dr. Nakia, sending you good vibes. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Educate Essentials. Educate Essentials' mission is to bring positive awareness and promote equity and inclusion in education by sharing information and topics about non-traditional learners. Educate Essentials' goal is to restore faith in education one student at a time by empowering listeners and viewers with knowledge because we all know knowledge is power, so let's be powerful. Let's go ahead and shift to our Educate Inspirational message. At the time of this recording, this is the month of April, and April is Autism Awareness Month. So I want to point out some books, 10 life-changing books about autism spectrum disorder for families and communities. So these books are inspiring. So here are 10 books that every family with autism should read and maybe every educator should have on their shelf. The first thing is 10 Things Every Child with Autism Wishes You Knew by Ellen Notham. This book provides 10 chapters that individually opens up about an explanation of a characteristic of autism as expressed through the lens of a child with autism. The second book is called The Loving Push, how parents and professionals can help spectrum kids become successful adults. And this book is by Temple Grandin and Deborah Moore. Temple Grandin is an advocate and an individual who has autism. And there have been many movies and stuff about Temple Grandin, so look her up because she's awesome. But Temple Grandin and Deborah Moore advocates for autism, share stories and tips from others, and chapters about ways to motivate children on the path to a meaningful life who have autism. The Loving Push, Our Parents and Professionals Can Help Spectrum Kids Become Successful Adults by Temple Grandin and Deborah Moore. The next book is A Thorn in My Pocket by Eustacia Cutler. This book is by Temple Grandin's mother, and she shares her personal story of raising a child with autism during the 1950s. And this was a time when students with disabilities were once excluded. So she talks about her journey and how she raised Temple and Temple grew up to become a successful person and individual who is now an advocate for autism. So that's a great book that you might want to look at. A Thorn in My Pocket by Eustacia Cutler. The next one is Life Animated, a story of sidekick heroes and autism by Ron Suskin. This is a father's memoir of how a nonverbal young boy with autism and his family used Disney movies to help him find his voice. I have a little connection with this book because when I was, my son was younger, um, he loved Disney movies as well. And he did not talk a lot, but he would actually repeat a lot of Finding Nemo and The Incredibles in those Disney movies. This book hits a little close to home. Life Animated, a story of sidekicks, heroes, and autism by Ron Suskin. The next book I want to talk about is from Temple Grandin. Once again, it's called Different, Not Less. And in this book, Brandon shares inspiring stories of achievement, successful employment, encouragement for adults with autism, autism spectrum disorder, and ADHD. So check that out. Different, Not Less by Temple Grandin. The next one is Becoming an Autism Success Story by Anita Lesko. This book is written by Lesko, and it tells the story of how she was diagnosed at the age of 50 with autism. And she shares her journey and describes how she went from an uncoordinated, awkward, different kid to a successful and thriving adult and learning how she learns and learning about herself. So Becoming an Autism Success Story by Anita Lesko. Check that one out. The next one is the Special Needs School Survival Guide. And it is a handbook for autism, sensory processing disorder, ADHD, learning disabilities, and more. And this book is by Kara Kosinski. Kosinski is an occupational therapist, and she shares detailed knowledge and information about accommodations, learning disabilities, and other valuable information. So check that book out, The Special Needs School Survival Guide. Number eight is Asperger Kids by Jennifer Cook O'Toole. In this book, O'Toole shows how to help children on the spectrum by understanding their thinking and using their particular interests to promote their learning. 
So Asperger Kids by Jennifer Cook O'Toole. The next one is Behavior Solutions for the Home and Community by Beth Yoon. In this book, Yoon addresses and solves problematic behaviors related to autism and strategies to support those behaviors. So check that out, Behavior Solutions for the Home and Children by Beth Yoon. The next book is 1001 Great Ideas for Teaching and Raising Children with Autism or Asperger's by Ellen Autumn and Veronica Sis. In this book, it prevents more than 1,800 ideas for parents and educators, tips and strategies for working with children with autism. And finally, don't forget yours truly. So I have a couple of books as well, and I want to throw my books in here. I said 10 books, but we're going to say 13 books. So I'm going to throw my books in here. And as you know, I have essential tips for special education leaders. I talk about ways that leaders and teacher leaders can empower their students with disabilities. In the book, I talk about autism and I talk about my personal journey as being a parent of a child with autism and how that went into my role as being a leader an educator, and a parent. Also, I have essential tips for parents. So that book is out. It's available on Amazon. And that book, I talk more from a parental perspective. I talk about autism and ways that parents can empower their child. And then my newest book is Essential Tips for Educators. In this book, I provide information. It serves as a resource for gen ed and special education teachers. It provides ways to support all students with disabilities. And in that book, I talk too about my journey as a parent. But then I also talk about ways that you can empower students with all disabilities. And in that book, I talk about autism as well. So check out those books. I will have all those books on the Educate the Centuries YouTube page with the links so you can go in and check them out and purchase your book as we celebrate Autism Awareness Month in April. Now it's time for some essential news. And as we go into our essential news, I want to highlight a couple of things. The Respond, Innovate, Support, and Empower Act, which is called the RISE Act, has been reintroduced to both chambers of Congress with bipartisan support. This bill will allow colleges to use existing documentation such as IEPs and 504 plans as a necessary proof of disability services for a child to actually get those disability services at the college level and accommodations. Right now, most campuses currently require outside evaluations and physicians um, notes and things like that, which can be costly. So a lot of times the universities will want the parents and families to go get a new psychological report and those things range for about $500. So with the RISE Act, students and families will be able to use those school K through 12 documents and take those to colleges and apply disability services at the disability centers and colleges will use that documentation to be enough proof to say, hey, this child has a disability and these are the accommodations we're willing to provide. Yes, I think that's wonderful that the RISE Act is going to be reintroduced. I know a lot of the work I do with EduFaith my business is making sure that I work with families to ensure that they can apply for those accommodations and get those accommodations. And I know that one stumbling block that we have run into is that a lot of colleges want those. They will look at the 504 or look at the IEP, but they really want to update the psychological report, which, like I said, is costly. And we don't want students to have barriers or ways where they can't get accommodations. They had accommodations in high school, they should be able to get them in college. So with the RISE Act, this means that colleges will consider those documents from high school for a child as they provide those necessary accommodations for that child to continue to be successful. Also, the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services announced $224 million in discretionary grant opportunities to the Office of Rehabilitation Services and Administration. With these funds, they're going to help support the Disability Innovation Fund's Pathway to Partnership Innovation Model Demonstration Project. And this project focuses on creating systematic approaches to transition services for students and children with disabilities. The estimated ranges of money and awards include $4 million to $10 million, with an average of $7 million for a five-year project. The Disability Innovation Fund is a fund that supports and it is aimed at providing those activities of increasing competitive integrated employment as defined in Section 7 of the Rehabilitation Act for youth and other individuals. So basically, these are grant opportunities for five-year grant opportunity funds for individuals to help support students with disabilities or individuals with disabilities gain that competitive employment and get competitive employment opportunities. So kudos, Department of Education. I see that there's a lot going on. And that includes the RISE Act to help students 
as they go to college and get those accommodations. And then in the additional funding of the vocational grant opportunity to help those individuals get employment once they graduate as well. So we got the college covered with the RISE Act, and then we got employment opportunity funding increase from the U.S. Department of Education. And with that, that's our essential news for today. Now it's time for our essential knowledge. As I mentioned earlier, April is Autism Awareness Month. So what we're going to do for today's episode is we're going to talk about autism and autism awareness. So all of the information that I have today, I got from the CDC website. I will have that link dropped into the Edge of Faith Essentials YouTube page. So you can go in and get this data and look at the resources. I will say the CDC had a wonderful variety of resources. Autism spectrum disorder is a developmental disability caused by differences in the brain. Some people with autism spectrum disorder have a known difference, such as a genetic condition. Others is unknown. We don't know why people are born with autism. There's still a lot to learn. Researchers are still working to identify ways to support individuals and autism spectrum disorder. But at the current time, there's no rhyme or reason of, of why a person is born with autism spectrum disorder. There's still a lot to learn. And I'm sure over time, we'll have new data that we find and research every day that'll be introduced to us. Speaking of data, let's talk about autism and how autism spectrum disorder impacts individuals. About one in 36 children has, have been identified with autism spectrum disorder. And that information and estimate comes from the CDC's Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network. Autism is reported to occur in all racial, ethnic, and social economic groups. So autism doesn't care who you are and what the background is. It can manifest, like I said, in any individual in a variety of ways. ASD is, I do want to point out that autism spectrum disorder or ASD is nearly four times more common in boys among girls. That's interesting. And when you're looking at autism spectrum disorder, about one in six, 17% of children aged which is three to 17 years old were diagnosed with a developmental disability as reported by their parents. And when you look at those developmental disabilities that families or children had, they included autism, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, blindness, and cerebral palsy. When we're looking at the signs of autism spectrum disorder, people may behave, communicate, and interact in different ways. I like to say that autism spectrum disorder is a wide umbrella. So that means the people may interact differently and it may impact one person differently than it may impact another. It's just a wide spectrum of behaviors and there's no one size fit all. It doesn't matter what background you come from. It just is something that manifests and it comes out and it's usually diagnosed around age three. Autism may not be readily visible to the eye for some individuals. And in some individuals, you might see some social signs and some things um, that may indicate that that person has autism spectrum disorder. The abilities can range and they can impact others significantly Why it may impact others in other different ways. Some people with autism spectrum disorder may have advanced conversational skills, whereas others may be nonverbal. Some people with autism spectrum disorder may need a lot of support, whereas others may be able to independently work and live without support. In this section right here, I want to just provide maybe a few social signs repetitive or restrictive behaviors or interests that a person with autism spectrum disorder, and then some other characteristics. Like I said, all this information I have in the link on the Edge of Faith Essentials YouTube page. So I'm going to just point out just a few of those social signs. So for instance, social signs include avoid or does not keep eye contact. Maybe a child does not respond to their name at around nine months of age. They may not show facial expressions around nine months of age. They may not share interest in playing with others around 15 months of age. They may not point to show you something. They may not notice what others are hurt or upset. They may overlook other children that may want to join them and play by themselves, according to those developmental milestones. When you're looking at those repetitive or restrictive behaviors or interests, for instance, a child may line up their toys or objects a certain way, and if you move those things, they might get upset. They might repeat words or phrases over and over again. For instance, my son, he loved Nemo, and he would quote in verbatim, quote, finding Nemo. He would verbatim quote Toy Story. He would verbatim quote um, The Incredibles. So I, I'm very familiar with repeated words or phrases. They may play with their toys the same way every time. They may be focused on 
parts of examples of a toy, such as a wheel. They may have obsessive interests. They may, they must follow certain routines. They may flap their hands, self-soothe, rock, um, pace the floor, self-spin in circles. So those are just some examples of those restrictive or repetitive behaviors. And then other characteristics may include delayed language skills, movement skills, cognitive skills. You might see some other disorders in there, such as hyperactivity, inattentive, anxiety, unusual eating habits, anxiety, stress. There are many more, like I said, on the CDC's website, and they have a lot of great resources there. But I just wanted to point out some of those signs, social signs, repetitive signs, and other characteristics when you're looking at or noticing someone with autism spectrum disorder. So when diagnosing a child with autism or autism spectrum disorder usually comes from a physician. So it can be difficult to identify because there's no test that exists. Doctors do look at the child's developmental history, those developmental milestones, and behaviors to make a diagnosis. So ASD, the diagnosis usually comes to fruition at around three years of age, and it can last through a person's lifetime. And although those symptoms may improve over time, some children show ASD symptoms within the first 12 months, while others may not show symptoms until 24 months, or some other children may show those symptoms later. Over time, like I said, the symptoms may improve. However, there is no cure for autism right now. Um, some children learn and gain new skills, and they meet those developmental milestones. Now, some children with autism spectrum disorder may gain new skills and meet developmental milestones until around 18 or 24, and that's when they may stop making those learning games or actually lose some of the skills that they once had. I want to note that developmental monitoring is critical when diagnosing or looking for indicators for a child with autism. So looking at those milestones, looking at how the child is progressing to those milestones, having those conversations with the pediatricians and talking about your child's skills, abilities through parent observations in areas such as playing, learning, speaking, behaving, and moving. The Academy for Pediatrics developed a range in a timeline for those developmental milestones. So they look at children at around nine months of age, and then they also look at children around 18 months of age, 30 months of age with those wellness visits. In addition, the AAP recommends that all children be screened precisely for autism spectrum disorder during their regular visits at around these ages, which include 18 months and 24 months. Looking at treatments for autism spectrum disorder, there are a variety of treatments. Like I said, there's no cure, but they can be treatments in certain areas. So I want to highlight those areas where treatments. The first one is behavioral, and the focus for behavior is they focusing on changing those behaviors by understanding what happens and maybe what can you do before and after that behavior. When you're looking at developmental focuses for treatment plans, developmental focus focuses on those and improving those specific developmental skills, such as language skills or social skills. Educational skills may come in the classroom setting. So these may come in the lines of your special education teacher, your school therapist, your occupational therapist, related services, speech language providers, and all those educational and school staff that provide those treatments within the school day as a part of that free and appropriate public education. When you look at it as social and relational focus, you're focusing on improving social skills and building those emotional bonds. Pharmacological, I want to indicate there are no treatments that actually cure autism. So I want to point out there is no medical cure or pharmacological cure for autism spectrum disorder. However, there are medicines that provide or med mediate those symptoms that can occur to help people with autism spectrum disorder function better. When you're looking at psychological, those type of treatments can help people with autism spectrum disorder cope with anxiety, depression, and mental and other health issues. And then all others they are umbrella under complementary and alternative treatments. And those treatments are any of those treatments that do not fit into these categories here of the behavioral, developmental, educational, social, relational, pharmacological, psychological. So those are also available and those treatments are available that don't actually fall under those categories. So when you're looking at supports, like how can I get supports for autism spectrum disorder? Or how can I find information to support my child with autism spectrum disorder? I want to point out these sites. 
And one of the sites includes the American Academy of Pediatrics Council on Children with Disabilities. I will have that link on the Edge of Faith Essentials YouTube page. The Autism Society, Autism Speaks, the Integral Autism Coordinator Committee, and the National Institute on Child Health and Human Development. As well, I say a lot of this information that I received today, I use a lot of information from the CDC site. So I will have that site there as well because they had a lot of resources and information for parents along with data and statistics. So those are some resources that can help families and educators and leaders when you're looking at ways to treat autism spectrum disorder or work with a child with autism spectrum disorder. So my essential tips for everyone today, my educators, I want you guys to work with your families and your parents and Decide and determine joint ways you can support your students with disabilities in the classroom. I know it may sound like a broken record, but this is so important that parents and educators work together. Educators, if you're not sure on something, seek that district and leadership within your building. You want to learn how to work with students, all students, students with autism or any type of exceptionality or disability. So you want to make sure you hone in on your teacher craft, that you build efficacy so you can positively influence instruction, provide those accommodations and hone in on the resources that are within your districts. And then once you become an expert, pour it to others. Start leading trainings and becoming a lead teacher so you can help support and empower other teachers. So that's my essential tip for educators. For my parents, I want you to identify ways to support your child. See how autism or whatever their disability is impacts them and work on plans and ways that you can empower your child and help mitigate those circumstances and that disability and how it impacts your child. There are resources out there hub a resource. The district has resources. There are a lot of community resources. There are also resources that I just provided on the essential knowledge page. So go to the, ed, go to the Edge of Faith Essentials YouTube page, look at some of those resources, and just find out what supports are there, whether it's within your church, um, parent mentors within the district, some type of educational workshop that you could take online, or just other classes where you actually could take your child and you guys socially interact with other communities of like-minded individuals and families that have the same exceptionalities. So push into your resources and push in to support your child. And for my leaders, I want you to empower your teachers, your parents, your stakeholders, everyone with that educational environment that's inclusive to all students. So you want to make sure that your students who have autism, but whatever the disability is, that they're included in the building. The culture is an inclusive culture. And you want to work with your district to cultivate resources and work with your district to build your teams, empower your teachers, make sure that you're having those workshops and activities in to help all stakeholders, families, educators, and those in the community support our exceptional population. And you want to make sure that your educators are well-trained, that your parents are involved, and that your students with exceptionalities know who you are and that you are getting that love and hugs and you have to support them and fostering that whole village approach as a leader. It's time for my book excerpt for today. And I talked about a lot of different books. And in my books, I also mentioned particularly essential tips for special education leaders and essential tips for parents. I mentioned my own journey. And I know I talk a lot about my journey with my own son who has autism spectrum disorder and um, attention deficit disorder. So I just wanted to read a little excerpt from, I'm going to read from Essential Tips for Special Education Leaders. And I'm going to start on page 76 of my newest edition because I did revise that edition. Just talk about how I felt as a parent. So over time, the frustration began to manifest into problematic behaviors. On one occasion, Alex drew a pencil after he couldn't copy something on the board. He had trouble completing assignments and would cry a lot. The teachers would contact me daily and I would come down and fuss at him in the restroom, reeling with embarrassment. One time I took him down the hall and spanked him in the bathroom. Nothing worked. I was mentally exhausted and tired of those teachers. My coworkers came to me about my child and I was starting to dislike them. Alex was my baby, my cub, and I was trying to protect him from those mean teachers who did not understand. And so in the story, I'm just to give you a little background. My son was actually diagnosed when he was five years old. We saw some of those indicators at about three years old. When he was little, he was the only child. So we tried to chalk a lot of that up to him being the only child. But he did have some social, um, he lacked social interactions. He lacked um, being vocal or talking. He would um, repeat Finding Nemo and Disney movies. And so we noticed those things. We got him some speech services in third. And his kindergarten experience was, oh my gosh, 
it was very overwhelming as a parent. And I was an educator at the school. I worked at the school and my coworkers were my colleagues who are, were his teacher who were coming every day telling me to come down to the class because he was having all these meltdowns and things before he was diagnosed with autism spectrum. So that just talks about how I was frustrated over time and they were calling me and I know they were doing me a favor, but it was just so overwhelming and frustrating because I'm like, why is he not copying the board like everyone else and what's going on? And I wanted to protect him and I wanted to listen to them, but I was just so exacerbated by his, um di- before he had his diagnosis on figuring out what was wrong. I go on to talk about how I changed the schools and it still wasn't until first grade where I, my friend of mine actually told me that something was wrong. And then I had started to believe her all the te- other teachers told me and I believed them, but I just didn't want to face it. And I talk about how at the end he was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and some visual spatial um, disorders, which helped actually, actually impact his copying on the board. And that's why he would be frustrated. But I just read, like I said, pages 78, 77, 76 of um, 76 through 77 of essential tips for special education leaders. And in that chapter, I talk about parents of students with disabilities. And then I talk about my personal journey and how I had to face it. And then how I had to have my voice and be a part of that community because it took a village for me to learn about how to tell my teachers or my fellow colleagues how to work with my child. But it also opened my eyes as well because I learned that there was a diagnosis there and he wasn't just misbehaving in school. So Essential Tips, that's my book excerpt. And it's in my Essential Tips for Special Education Leaders and my Essential Tips for Parents. All of my books and resources are on Amazon. Now it's time for essential advice or share inspirational stories. This part of the podcast, I want to use this platform to support fellow educators and families. So if you have a question, you want advice, you need direction on something, please email me at edufaithforall at gmail.com. E-D-U-F-A-I-T-H, the number four, A-L-L at gmail.com. Also, you know, I'm always talking about inspirational stories. I also want to encourage you to email me and share an inspirational story. So if you are a family or if you know of a family, community member, or educator that's doing something awesome within their community with students with disabilities, students with exceptionalities, diverse learners, or any type of learner, please feel free to email that story, that link. Give me a little synopsis. I will share it on the show as a part of my inspirational message. So essential advice or essential inspiration, come and share with me at edufaithforall at gmail.com. So my words of wisdom is coming from Temple Grandin, and I talked about a lot of her books today, and it's actually the title for one of her books. So the quote I want to leave you with is, I am different, not less, because individuals with disabilities, individuals with autism, they're different, but they're no less than anyone else. The other quote I want to leave with you is, autism is part of my child. It's not everything he is. My child is so much more than a diagnosis. And that is by S.L. Coho, which is an author. So those words of wisdom come from Temple Grandin and Coho. So autism is a part of my child. It's not everything he is. My child is so much more than a diagnosis. As a parent of a child with a disability, this quote resonates with me. So I want you guys to remember those words of wisdom as you go about your day as we end this podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Edufaith Educational Services. Edufaith Educational Services is my business. I provide a variety of educational services under the umbrella of Diverse Learner Services. So that includes educational consulting for parents, educators, and leaders. So parents, if you're trying to understand the process to get services for your child, or you're looking at an IEP and you're trying to navigate those services, those intervention services or anything, I'm here for you. I'm here to support you. So keep Edufaith Educational Services in mind for my leaders and my educators. I'm also here to provide any supports in diverse learner services and trainings. I'll provide a college accommodation, advocacy, consulting, and training. So if you're trying to get your child into college and you're trying to navigate the waters of how to go through disability services, the application process, et cetera, Edufaith Educational Services can help you with that. I provide parent education trainings for school districts, communities, and any other supports regarding to diverse learner services, college and career coaching for students who are transitioning into college or employment 
whether they have a disability or not. I'm here to serve and provide those services because sometimes we need additional support in trying to navigate those waters once our children graduate from high school. I also provide district professional development in relation to diverse learners or related topics that you request. And then I specialize in services for students with disabilities, which include interventions, English speakers of other languages, education and leadership coaching for educators and leaders. Because leaders and educators, sometimes you need that non-evaluative approach to help you navigate the waters and help provide what you need for students. And then finally, I provide program development under IDEA Section 504, those trainings and diverse learners. If you're interested in any of those services, please feel free to reach out at www.edgeoffaithconsulting.com. Thank you as always for listening to my believers. Be blessed to all others. Be kind, be well, and be the change. Thank you for always supporting Edge of Faith Educational Services. I love you guys and there's nothing you can do about it. Subscribe and follow Edge of Faith Essentials on YouTube and listen to the podcast on Andorra, Amazon, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and other platforms. Please feel free to like me on Facebook under Edge of Faith Educational Services, Twitter under Edge of Faith S, and then Instagram, Edge of Faith 2021. Thank you for always listening, and you guys have a wonderful day.